transform is a town of Hawaii fisheries, the full story. Um, it's a it's a nice format. It's quite different. Uh, it's unique, uh, but I think it's going to be very very informative. A distinguished uh, panelists and a moderator. Um, so uh, the forums are held in conjunction with uh, the, the, the fishery council's uh, meetings. We have right now going on the 172nd council meeting at Abington uh, uh, YMCA uh, called Vanike. Uh, yeah, Vanike YMCA. Uh, today was the first day we covered uh, Hawaii archipelago and protected uh, species. Um, I'm pleased to report that you know one of the items that we talked about was a stock assessment for the, for the main point I was body fish in the Seo Onaga Pakapaka complex of seven body fish. The good news is the, fish, the scientists have declared the fishery healthy. Not overfished, uh, no overfishing by nine. So um, these are, things are going well. Uh, we would invite everybody if they can to try and attend. Now, I know that uh, people, uh, people got a fish. Fishermen got a fish. It's hard for them to attend these meetings for the daytime. And that's one of the purposes of these forums. Is we hold it tonight, so after all, um, and, uh, you know, hope to make it more accessible to, to people who work and fish for the day. But if you are able to attend, uh, we certainly would invite you to attend um, our meetings. Um, in the audience, we have uh, council members as well as council staff who will be carefully listening to you. Uh, and so this will be an opportunity for you not only to learn, but also to tell us what you think. We are around operation, not top down. We don't dictate what you should think or what you should say. We want you to tell us what you feel, what you think, and you consider. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our uh, Executive Director Extraordinaire, uh, Kitty Sun. Kitty. So previous forums, you know, we've covered like data collection, marine monuments, my favorite subject, bottom fish, seafood safety and traceability, stock assessments, non-commercial fishing, um, marine spatial planning, fishermen, scientists. And what these forums do is they really highlight the expertise of the fishermen, the scientists, and fishery management. So kind of like what Ed said, tonight's forum on Hawaii's fisheries getting full story it is slightly different. Our panelists tonight are reporters, anchors, producers, and publishers with decades of experience covering stories about Hawaii's fisheries through the media of TV, radio, and print. And the council is very interested in this topic because we realize that public perception can drive policy and media helps formulate public perception. We're interested in this topic as well because through the Magnuson Fishery Conservation and Management Act, um, the way we operate is a bottom to top rather than a top to bottom approach to, to management. So we seek the expertise of fishermen who are regularly on the water interacting with the marine ecosystem to tell us about the issues and to help us solve those problems and issues. But also to get the best results, the fishermen must also be educated about the management process um, and the multiple factors the council considers during its uh, decision making deliberation. For example, um, just a little example, is that by law we have to manage according to the best 
scientific information available, as well as their 10 national standards that all the councils have to adhere to. But each region is very different, the ecosystem is different, the fisheries are different. So, but we all have standards that we all have to follow. So our hope is that this forum will foster a better dialogue among the council, the news media, uh, the fishing and seafood communities. And so our motto has always been that we need to have local fish forever. And so in order to do that, we really do have to all work together to make that happen. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the moderator of tonight's panel, Paula Akana. She needs no introduction, but I would say that she is an anchor on KITV Island News. She produces special reports on a regular basis, tackling subjects that range from sustainability and fighting to island efforts to beat breast cancer, and stories that have highlighted hula music and the voyages of the Kunu Hokulea. She began her career at KITV as an intern in 1983 and is a graduate of Kamehameha Schools and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Journalism from our University of Hawaii at Manoa. So Paula, I turn this all over to you. Thank you so much. This is gonna be a fun time. I'm gonna have the, the panelists can come and uh, take their seats. We'll do some introductions. For the first hour or so, we'll be asking them questions. You know, about getting the stories, how do you get the stories, what do you look for, and so forth. And then in the second hour, we're gonna open up to the mic for you folks. And so if you have any questions uh, for the panelists here on how to get your story told, or you know, asking them about some of the information that they've been receiving, um, you can ask them just about anything you want. I'm going to start at the end here, and you know, he needs no introduction. <laughs> Stan Wright is a media icon in the state of Hawaii. Co-hosting Let's Go Fishing from 1977 to 1988. I know in our household we grew up watching that show, loving it all the time. He was a radio talk show host on the radio for 20 years, as well as a commercial photographer and the contributing writer for Hawaii Fishing News. He's a member of the Outdoor Writer Association of America and is the Boy Scouts of America's certified angling instructor. So we want to welcome Stan Wright. I've known this next guy for many, many years. Dean Sensui, executive producer of Hawaii Ghost Fishing. For the past 14 years, prior to that, he was the chief photographer for the Honolulu Star Bulletin, where he worked for 24 years. And we were out in the field together many, many times. And last year, he co-produced a feature film, Go For Broke, and talked about the origins of the famed 442nd Regimental Combat Team. So welcome to Dean Sensui. Carrie Johnson is our next panelist. She's the executive publisher of Hawaii Fishing News. We welcome you. The monthly magazine is part of her family's publishing business, which has promoted stewardship, diversity, and family fun for over four decades. Carrie also has over 25 years of state, federal, and private sector experiences in mediation, risk communication, environmental program and project man management, and as a program analyst and a woodsman liaison officer. So we welcome Carrie Johnson. Nathan Eagle is the staff reporter for our partners at KITV, Honolulu Civil Beat. He covers everything from state government and commercial fishing to ocean-related issues and politics. He moved from his native home in Ohio in 2007 to be the environmental reporter for the Garden Island newspaper on Kauai. He rose to the position of managing editor there before he moved to Oahu in 2012 to work for Civil Beat. 
Nathan has won many, many awards, statewide and national awards as well, for series on ocean safety, and series on unfunded liabilities, data journalism, and so much more. So we welcome Nathan Eagle. And my dear, dear friend, Catherine Cruz, a member of the Hawaii Public Radio's news team, co-host of The Conversation. It's a daily hour of locally focused discussions of public affairs, ideas, culture, and the arts. Catherine has been a television reporter in Hawaii since 1983. We started like six months apart at KITV. She's won a number of awards and respect from the statewide audience. She spent more than 30 years at KITV covering government, education, health, and uh, she's my best friend, Catherine Cruz. And Mike Buck, we were just laughing because 30 years ago, the three of us all worked at KITV. Because Mike Buck was back then too. Mike was really the issue. She was six and she was seven. <laughs> That's why we love Mike Buck. <laughs> Mike was raised and educated in Honolulu, Hawaii, and for over 54 years has been in TV and radio broadcasting, some of it outside of the islands, in Australia, Alaska, and on the U.S. mainland. Well known in Hawaii as the host of the Mike Buck Show, a conservative radio talk show that airs live weekday mornings across the state on AM 690 and FM 94.3. He also hosts the weekly radio show, Go Fish, that airs Saturday at 4 and rebroadcasts Sunday at 7, so welcome to Mike. So we have a number of questions, and in this hour we wanted to get to everybody and to leave time for you to ask your questions. So I'm going to actually have our questions be focused at just a couple of the panelists um, who will be answering each one. Uh, that way we can hear more from them on a variety of topics and then get to your questions as well. So our first question, and we're going to aim this at Nathan, Mike, and Dean. What are the biggest misconceptions or myths about Hawaii fisheries? For example, impacts to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Marine Monument Expansion Area. Um, you, all, you all have dealt with it in your day-to-day -day dealings in journalism. And I guess we'll start with, you want to start, Nathan? Sure. <laughs> Thank you guys all for coming out. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I've spent a lot of time writing about the monument, especially over the last few years. And there's a lot of misleading statements, misconceptions, myths on both sides that I had to kind of sift through in my coverage of that. Uh, you know, when we're talking about the expansion of are all the turtles going to die with the expansion? No, of course not. Uh, the other side is are you know commercial fishermen going to lose 10% of their profits essentially? No, not really. And so my job was to try to sift through that to inform the public as best I could and then let the cards fall it where they may. Dean? Well, for the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, they're talking about you know, closing off the area and saving a certain percentage of fish, somewhere between 5 to 10%. Uh, so what I tell people, well, you know, when you're talking about highly migratory species, they move all over the place. Um, I just talked to someone who said that he had a striped marlin that had a satellite tag on it. In fact, with Gary Beals, he might be in this room. And that satellite tag started from 300 miles south of the Big Island, ended up going to, I think it was, I think it was someplace like Taipei or something like that, across the, across the Pacific and back. Um, you'll see a poster back here with um, uh, satellite tag tracks that uh, Molly Lukovic's team has put in. They travel all over the place. So when you close off an area to protect a highly migratory species, it's like closing off a section of sky to protect ducks, right? All the ducks that are in that part of the sky, they're not going to get shot at because they're in a protect, protected area. The minute they fly out of that area, they're dead ducks. So the best way to protect ducks or any kind of migratory species, you have a season. In the case of big eye tuna, we have quotas. So when you hit that quota, all fishing stops for that, for that quota. That's how you protect the migratory species. So does the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands protect, uh, the expansion of the monument protect a migratory species? No. Does it hurt our local fishing industry? It can. Some days, all the fish that were brought in from, uh, brought into our uh, fish auction at Pier 38 had come out of that area. Some days it doesn't. Um, and it all depends. They move. 
So does it, does it matter to the fisheries? It does if you're looking at an auction floor that has no fish, and I've seen that. Um, and it eventually matters to those of you who want to buy your poke bowl and wonder why you can't get it or why you end up having to buy a frozen product. But uh, that's one of the myths, and it's something that uh, we're trying to dispel as best as we can. Mike? Yeah, I, I concur with Dean and with Nathan in, in many respects of what they both said. Uh, the only thing that one of the misconceptions that a lot of us have had is that sometimes the video or the pictures that they show of the Papahana Mokuakea are inshore. And they're talking about the, the longline boats being in that area, they're not. The longline boats are severely off, so they, the, the two shall never meet. And the other misconception is that without declaring the monument a monument, it would be overfished. At the time the Papahana Mokuakea was created, there were only nine fishermen from Hawaii still fishing that area. It's just too far away. So right now, it's a wonderful breeding ground. And I guess the science does not 100% support one way or the other yet, whether all of these small fish are migrating to the main Hawaiian Islands so that we can catch and eat them. If that is the case, you're gonna have a lot of happy fishermen. But right now, there is justice in thinking about justice. And that is, we need to have some fishing in that area, albeit supposed or limited. And until we're doing that, we're not going to really know if it's working or not. And then the other thing, of course, is that a lot of people don't understand, in particular with respect to our long line fleet, which is about 128 boats. Uh, they are the most highly regulated fishing fleet in the, in, the, in the world. And so they're not the bad guys. And, and one thing that Dean said, I agree, a fish doesn't know what grid it's in. So sometimes you can go someplace where there's a lot of big guy, and you can catch really plenty of fish. You go back there the next year and there's none. The fish haven't disappeared, they've just gone somewhere else. So that's some of them, those are some misconceptions I feel. And when we can get in concurrence, as Kitty was saying earlier, there is better and more accurate science available to the decision makers now than there ever was. Uh, if Dean can get into it later, he can tell you about the, the non-invasive way that you collect stock assessments with GoPro cameras instead of people swimming in there with like the fish. I hope we can get into that later. But those are some of the things that I think are both conceived and ill-conceived about what's going on in that monument. Thank you, Mike. Our next question is for Stan and Dean. From your experience, what questions do your audience want answered most? And what knowledge gaps do they have about Hawaii fisheries? And kind of include a description of your main target audiences. Oh man, I see you guys catch all those fish. Every day, I want to go fishing with you. How can I catch all those fish? They don't realize it took three days to do that half hour show. <laughs> well, one of the things I like to do is, uh, well, the audience that I would target are the family. I like to have a story or a show where people can say, oh man, my grandpa used to take me to do that. Or, oh man, I remember when dad used to take us to do that. Or, yeah, Grandpa and I do that together. Or the family goes out to the beach and does that. But the thing is with everybody wants to know how to catch the fish. And, and I where? guess- Where did you get it? Where, yeah, where, where did you get it? But it's not the where, it's the technique. That's what I always try to show, or even in the writing. This is how you do it. This is the lure you use. This is how you work the lure. This is the bait. This is how you rig the bait. This is how you fish the bait, the location. Not where we went. I remember we did a Let's Go Fishing show one time, and oh yeah, we were out at XYZ Beach Park. Mistake. The next weekend, you could not find a parking space within a quarter mile of that beach park, because everybody was out there. But the thing is, everybody wants to know, how can I catch the fish? And so that's what I try to do is, what can my story or TV show or now it's YouTube videos, what can we do to help you catch fish? Um, yeah, Stan is facing the same thing I face. You know, people always ask, where was it, where was it? And in the show, I never say where. Yes. I don't even tell you what island it is. In fact, um, <coughs> I, I, do, I do digital visual effects and, and sometimes I have to remove an object from the background so it's not real obvious what it is. Um, 
the fish are real, they're not digital fish. <laughs> and, and, and people ask, you know, where it was, I can't, I can't tell you because they'd kill me if I did. Um, and you lose the trust of the people that took you out there. Um, and, and really what it is, it's, um, and, and, and this is from somebody who is probably one of the worst fishermen out there. That's why I film fishing. I don't fish myself a whole lot. Um, you gotta, you gotta um, kind of explore on your own and find the spots. And, and once you learn to understand habitats and, and what fish really want, and that'll, that'll be a big step forward because they want pretty much the same things that we want. We want something to eat, a safe place to live, a clean environment. So when you think about that, you know, and you, and you think about, well, where can I find, like, for example, one of the things I go after is Mimbachi. They like structure. They like certain kinds of structure. So where can you find that structure? Um, unfortunately, a lot of the nearshore environments are messed up because of runoff, siltation, and just a lot of human impact. So you have to go offshore. You're going to go on a boat. Then, then you're going to just kind of hunt, look for places that have let's say artificial reefs or you know, certain kinds of rock structure. And, and, and today, Leonard um, Yamato was telling me that when he was a kid, this bottom fish fisherman took him out. And so as they're motoring out, he asked the bottom fish, fish, bottom fish fisherman, so how do you find the spots? And the bottom fish fisherman pulled back on the throttle, stopped the boat, they dropped the line, dropped the line all the way down. Ends up, all the line goes out, that's no more line in the basket. Okay, they're not here, so pull it up. Going along. Okay, so where are they? Pull back the throttle. Okay, drop the line. Same thing, all the line goes up, and then he started to figure out, oh, you look for the spots. And a lot of times the fishermen aren't going to tell you where those spots are. You just got to, like I said, you, look, you, you think about what the fish might want, and that's how you can find them, that's how you catch fish, and that's the answer for most of your problems, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question is for Catherine, Mike, and Stan. How do you typically get the story idea and background information for your articles or your radio or TV programs or YouTube? Uh, for example, do you seek multiple sides of the story? Who do you decide and how do you decide who to interview? I think we can start with Catherine. Well, I have to confess, the extent of my fishing is I have uh, tilapia in my backyard and my aquaponics. And I used to take my kids uh, to New Water Reservoir to fish. Uh, and, uh, but I'm a long distance uh, ocean swimmer, and so uh, I'm in waters all over the island. And I basically just keep my eyes open, and uh, you know, my curiosity hopefully will. Uh, lead me to stories, you know, if it's noticing that, yeah, there's just lots of turtles here, or we're, we're swimming and we're running into monk seals out in the ocean. Uh, you know, I, I know there was a, uh, an attempt at one point for the Native Hawaiian uh, Civic Clubs to consider uh, asking that the turtles be uh, taken off the list, the protected species list. And I grew up in Guam, uh, where out in Micronesia they eat turtles. And you know, seeing so many turtles, you, know, you, you start to think, yeah, well, maybe you know, the balance has shifted. Maybe something should change. Uh, but I'm, I'm out. I'm in the ocean. You know, whether I'm uh, swimming or going out with my cousin on their boat, and, and they fish. I don't fish. But it's just keeping your eyes open. Uh, you know, you, you don't understand something. You ask questions. You call up the LNR. You call up NOAA. And that kind of leads, you know, you to maybe a gem of a story that you can do. So I, I just try and just keep my eyes open and be very aware of where I swim, what I see, uh, and I just talk to as many people as possible. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, who we talk to and how long we talk to them in TV, we do long interviews and then we only use a snippet of it, you know, and radio out of finding, oh gosh, we can talk to them for seven, ten minutes, wow, that's a lot. But, it's just finding out as much information and then trying to hone in on what the nugget of the story is. You know, whether it's something about enforcement with either DLNR or NOAA. Uh, it's, it's really just keep your eyes open, you know, uh, keep your ears to the ground and talk to as many people as possible. Thank you. I, I sort of, I really agree with Catherine. A little different though is that, that I do a four hour day show, one hour in Los Angeles and three hours here. And so, my, my audience 
are the ones that are the hungry birds in the nest. So usually I follow up on something. If they've come to think that I'm going to be the answer for a fishing question, I go follow up on that. The, the, the pitfall that many of us get into is going to the same source for verification. And sometimes you see on television, anytime somebody's talking about a certain subject, there's a certain guy or gal that is the go-to person. Well, that's just one opinion. So you need to get all the opinions. That's what makes it kind of tough. Uh, I, I can tell you that most of the audience feels, uh, with regards to Catherine, turtles taste really good. And we, and we used to eat them a lot. And it just goes to show you that when you kapu something, it works. The species comes back. Now there are more turtles than there ever were. Are we going to stop taking them again? Probably not. But there will be sustenance. Why fishermen will be able to? They tag. Remember some of you? How many of you had a turtle tag when they, when they, when they first tagged? Ed, did you have one? Some people have these. I had one. It was good for one turtle a year, I think. But it, it, what, what she said is true. You're out swimming and you see them. You think, well, hey, maybe, maybe they've come back. Have the monk seals come back? Yeah, they have. Not enough, but they're coming back. And some others. So I think the way I go after my stories is, first of all, I'm a commentator rather than a journalist. Although I have a degree in journalism, I, I don't consider myself a journalist anymore because I opinionate. And I think the real danger is getting somebody that opinionates and, ha and thinking that's journalism or that's the facts. That's the facts as I see them. So I try to make the pebble and the pond a little bit bigger. And I have to have some. I, I sometimes, on the radio, bite my tongue so hard it bleeds. You can't see it. But I'm thinking, you can't possibly be thinking that. And yet, you have to give them the floor. So I think what's happening here, and, and I, I read everybody's work, and I see everybody's stuff. It's so neat to be in one place with everybody at one time to see if we agree. Uh, I think we kind of do. And I think what happens is, and this is my final thought on what makes a story it doesn't. If you go to a hearing or a meeting right now, they're in the session. The only people who go to these things are the ones that are opposed. So our legislators just hear the negative all the time, never the positive. And they have the darn meetings in the middle of the day when we're fishing or working. Now here's where we're tonight. So these delegates will be able to go to their representatives and their senators and their council people and say, look, my constituents say this. Please give them an audience. And so that's what this is, the bottom up thing that Kitty Simons was talking about. Everything that you guys are seeing tonight is being recorded and will be used against you. <laughs> or, or it will be used in your favor. In any case, that's how, we, that's how I try to gather a story. And the other thing is to keep it interesting. And make sure that people say, I had no idea, or I learned something from you guys today. That's what, that's what makes us think. I'm going to ask Stan and then Nathan, I'm going to ask you to talk about this one as well. So Stan, what, what do you look for? How do you get your story ideas? Well, the most wonderful part about being on the Let's Go Fishing show, I met so many wonderful people and they all wanted to share their love of fishing with me. And everybody's got a story, so it was real easy to do. When I did have something that was maybe controversial, I tried to be neutral and give both sides of it and not even... So I think a great compliment would be to somebody is, well, what side are you on? That way, you, you know, you're, you're giving both sides. Now I'm retired. I don't care. <laughs> I, I go for stories and stuff that I want to do, that I like, that I'm interested in. For instance, like the uh, trout fishing over on Kauai. Uh, what's, it, what's it happening? Let's, let's show the people having fun. Let's write about the, the families that go up there and do this. But let's talk about the problems that they're having. And maybe we can get more funding to expand it. Maybe we can expand this or get more involvement in that. So just, you know, these are things that I'm interested in. Yeah, I know the guy that retired. And you, well, you know, this, when you do your stories like this, okay, what was it, new one of fishing, the cap fishing? And they said, we don't have any more money and we can't do it, and they shut it down. It was so popular, everybody loved that. The Girl Scouts went up there, the Boy Scouts, families, everybody. Well, so many people started calling their legislators and everything, I understand there was a bill this year to maybe try to find some funding to bring that back. So that's why I'm talking about that trout thing over there and doing stories on that, posting pictures. You know, 
you're talking, we're up here, we're radio, we're TV, we're newspaper like that. Facebook. Share the story. Share your story on Facebook. The new word of mouth advertising nowadays is multimedia. Facebook. One person sees it, they share. Then three people, they share. 90 people, and they share. A thousand people. You can make a big influence by just having a picture of the fish that you caught or where you did or something pretty. Don't post 50 pictures of the same thing. Just pick out your one or two best shots and put that up there. Share your love of fishing with all of us, with all your friends. You don't know what a big impact that you guys could be doing. Can I just add something on the new water reservoir? Yes. Um, Sometimes when I would get bored, I'd walk around and just kind of see what people were catching. And there was one gentleman who worked, uh, I think he was a volunteer, his name was Klaus. And uh, he used to make sure that all the little kids would catch a fish, so he would give them a special treat. Well, come to find out, he said he worked for um, a Purina Company, Ralston Purina. So I don't know what he used, but man, all those kids caught <laughs> fish. So, if, you know, if you can find out what, what his secret was and what he used, uh, dog food, cat food, I have no idea, but he caught fish. All right, Nathan, we, how do you approach a story and, and look for that story idea? Um, and, and how do you go about putting it together? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, stories for me come from a lot of different sources. Sometimes it's sitting through long, long meetings, like Westpac meetings, <laughs> uh, which I'm missing this week because uh, I'm sitting in legislative meetings instead. And, but sometimes the, that really serves the purpose, though, because not only do I come away with a story idea, but sometimes I'll learn quite a bit and answers to things that I wouldn't even know the question to ask. And so I find them very valuable and I'm willing to put in that time. Other times it's, it's readers. Uh, it's, it's people who are like, hey, have you noticed this trend or here or there? Like, I don't know, I could worth looking into. And I take all of those seriously. And they're worth vetting. Sometimes they turn into a story, sometimes they end up in the trash bin, but it's, I don't think that's fine. <laughs> Um, and then sometimes, like uh, Kathy was saying, it's just your own observations. It's just keeping your eyes open, your senses aware, and, and paying attention to what's going on. Um, what was the second half of it? Um, when you approach a story, how do you figure out who you're going to interview? Yeah. Do you look for both sides? You know, just yeah, absolutely. kind of a one-on-one. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, right now I'm buried in the legislature, so I'll be looking at different bills and tracking them. And my first source will be, well, who's the lead person that introduced this? Who's actually pushing this and thinks it's a great idea? And I'll start with them and really pick their brains. And then I'll be looking to people to find some kind of other viewpoint on it, uh, to give it some kind of balance, some kind of weight. I don't try, I don't strive to get 50 words for this person, 50 words for this person. Try to arrive at the truth of the matter. And, you know, we all have our inherent biases. And I think if we don't acknowledge that, I mean, it's not serving anyone well. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Our next question is for Catherine and Carrie. Do you think media coverage of Hawaii fisheries affects policy? And kind of, if you can, provide an example. We'll go with Carrie first. Uh, well, I'm the newest kid on the block, even though I, my dad started the magazine over 40 years ago when I was in high school, putting it together with him. Uh, but my role at, at this point is, is as of this year, so uh, I definitely am quite honored to be here today. Um, say that again, I'm sorry, I, I flew in this morning from, from Baltimore uh, today, so no problem. it's about 2 in the morning for me. Do you think media coverage of the fisheries here in Hawaii affects policy? Yes. Uh, particularly if I look at the 40 years that my, my father put together the magazine and put together the voices of Hawaii's fishermen for all these years, we've, for example, we've defeated the commercial, non-commercial fishing license at least three times, I think, over that time frame, uh, because of the influence of your voices, media uplifting your voices and making sure that they're heard. Uh, I don't think that would have happened without all of us using every intelligent voice that we could come together with and, and really make sure that decisions and actions were made that were sustainable and that made sense to the majority of people that were going to be impacted. Uh, and I think that's what 
ideally, what we that, that are in the trying to be the voice, your voice, collectively, um, we're really trying to make sure that we are representing you in the best way we can. Uh, and that means that we have to sometimes push the river uh, and, and make sure that people are listening, that are making decisions without necessarily listening as closely as we need them to listen. Uh, I think i just like to say that I, I covered so many legislative hearings and city council meetings and yes, a lot of these policy makers have the uh, studies from the experts, but I've seen so many times when it takes someone showing up at a meeting and just speaking from the heart and what they say and how they say it has really affected the decision makers. You know, one example I'll give is um, we were doing a lot of stories about monster homes when I worked at PITV. And uh, at a recent meeting, there was a woman in Palolo and she was emailing me and I was trying to encourage her to uh, uh, send testimony uh, to the council members about how this large home was affecting her life. And the example she gave was, um, you know, this, these were speculators and contractors that didn't get their permits and started building. And it, it was when she got to the point where she was telling the council members that this contractor, you know, I guess he was, uh, doing concrete work. He didn't have a permit and the, the pump burst. So there's concrete everywhere on cars and houses. And uh, when she complained to him, he he spit in her face. And it's just that kind of, you know, that that attitude, you know, aloha. But it took that woman just, you know, kind of like sharing her, her grief and her dismay that this was her home and now she's had to deal with you know, the situation. And there were a couple of council members, I think, that were really kind of on the fence about this issue. Um, but I think after listening to her testify and just, you know, speaking from the heart, I think it changed their mind. So whether it's, you know, monster homes or fisheries or, uh, you know, same-sex marriage, I think if people come and testify, uh, get involved in the process, just speak from the heart. I, I think you have an opportunity to touch the people who are making the decisions that will affect your life. This next question is for Carrie and anyone else after that. As well, do you think coverage of Hawaii's fisheries could be improved? And if so, could the council assist in how? Well, I think the council has already been assisting for a long time uh, because going back to the, the question you just asked. Uh, and, and the nature of all the questions, it's when we come together collectively, when we, when we bring our scientists together with our, the people that are actually catching fish, whether it's commercial or non-commercial, then we can go in and speak as media voices together, but most importantly, we can speak from the heart and come together as a people that are impacted and these are issues that relate to our culture, that relate to our lifestyle, we need to be unified. We need, even if we have different opinions, it's all about respect, learning, and education with each other. That's how we make these things, make the best decisions. That's the way this has always been in Hawaii. So why shouldn't we keep doing that? That, whether we, we come together and we decide that we need to respect a kapu kind of situation, or we need to tell the fishermen next to us, hey, you need to you should release that fish. That's not the right, do you, do you know that there are limits on fishing? A lot of it is we have to help each other in order to be a sustainable place where we all want to live and we'll have future generations that can enjoy the same lifestyles that we have. And so I don't think it's necessarily, you know, one or another. It's all together that we have to stand together for what we believe in and then what lifestyle that we wish to preserve. So for, for fishing, is so much of what we report on is a little bit of science. Try not to get too much into the politics because that's not our strength. And we try to be very neutral about that. But it's also about education and, and the love of fishing and why we all are out there wanting to do non-commercial fishing. It's it's a lifestyle thing where the person who flies in from Paris to you know fish the HIBT can sit at the restaurant for breakfast or at dawn and meet someone who just caught or is catching fish to feed his children and his grandchildren. 
if they can come together and talk story and have respect and honor each other and their joy and passion for fishing and the lifestyle that it supports for all of us. And I think that's what why fishing has always meant to me, is where we can all come together. It goes across borders, it goes across generations, and, and it's, it, we can all talk about the things that we value, and we have to stand up for those things. Mike, I see you. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. And, and I want to also tell you another thing based on something Catherine and Nathan said. Like the two of them, I'm spending a lot of time uh, in the big square building. And at, at the beginning of this session, just as an example, there were 3,000 bills put up in the House of the Senate. Uh, at the crossover, there are 300 left, so 90% are gone. Of the 300, 100 are likely to become laws. And there are many people in the fishery, including myself, that say, we don't need more laws. We need to enforce the ones that we already have. If everybody did exactly what the rules and regulations say uh, by the Department of Fisheries and DLNR, we'd have no problems here. But there are the abusers, and some of you may have seen the story just the other day. There's one banana at, at Wailupi with 12 pieces of gill net, 125, 1,200 feet of net. It's tagged, and two days later, it gets tagged by Wailupi doing the same thing. So, I mean, this guy's incorrigible. Just getting him out of the water takes, uh, just, just so that you know, and I, there, although this number would be arguable, there are about 300,000 people in Hawaii that have an umbilical cord to fishing. 150 of them are fishermen, and there's another 100,000 or more that are buyers, sellers, eaters, waiters, and everything else. In Hawaii, we fish to eat. You can't. You can't fill up your boat with fish in Northern California and take them to the market. You can't do that, you can't hear. So I think what Kerry was saying, what I say anyway, is it's not broken. We don't need to fix this. What we need to do is take the laws that we already have and make sure somebody enforces them. So what you need to do this time around is the DLNR is asking for another 20 or 30 officers. Not good. 20 or 30 more bodies, 15 of which are here on the island of Oahu, where most of the infractions are. But the more serious infractions are made on the neighbor islands by people who have no supervision. And so that's what we have to look out for. We have to look out for ourselves. And you have to be not afraid to say to somebody that's fishing, you're not supposed to do that. Or better yet, take a picture with your cell phone and send it to the DLNR. 643 DLNR, bust them. And if you do that, we'll all be all right. We'll have enough to fish and the fishery will remain, remain sustainable. Uh, in regards to what we can do with Westpac together, uh, I, I love printing the science articles that we get from you. Uh, it's, it adds depth to the education that we really want to provide. The more we can continue to talk about what are the impacts, why are we not seeing the same kind of fish in the shore? Is it because we don't have a fishing license or is it because of the uh, leaching that's going on to, to the reefs from so many different, whether it's effluent from sewage or whether it's uh, outflow from the poisons on the golf courses or whatever is contributing to what's been going on for 20 plus years in Hawaii and it continues to get a little bit worse every, every year. Whether that's it or, or all, there's so many different contributing factors and it's a very complex situation which is why we need to talk about it more and need more science but at the same point, there are other factors such as, do we need to increase more fees in, from our fishermen that are feeding their families with the fish? Or do we also recognize, in, in one uh, article that we just printed for the American Sport, Sports Fishing Association, fishing, sports fishing, so non-commercial, is contributing more to the economy in most states in this country than tourism. It is what is the most significant taxable dollar that is going already to each state for through the GE tax. So we already are contributing a sizable amount of income. Through that, it goes into the general fund. So I don't necessarily think money, more money is necessarily the answer. It's how to be smart about what we know and how to apply what we know for a long-term sustainable actions that are comprehensive, looking at all the different factors that contribute to it. And that's why we really need Westpac's participation, because you do a lot of that on your everyday approach to how to manage. And, and so I really welcome more from you guys, because I think it, it really is key to us finding the solutions together. Especially for Catherine and Nathan. 
when we cover stories uh, that have to do with fisheries um, or closing off an area, how do you attack that? Because it's, it, especially for someone who doesn't fish, it's, it's pretty intense information. And to try to bring that down to our viewing audience or our reading audience or our online audience, how do we take that macro of fisheries and fisheries management and, and, and get it to the people who, who we want to get it across to? Well, I, I'm just trying to think of you know, an example. Um, I think when they were talking about expanding, you know, the monument, and I remember uh, interviewing it was a Coast Guard admiral, and there are folks. The argument, you know, a lot of uh, fishermen out there are the eyes and ears. So when you do get folks that are fishing in our waters illegally, you know, the uh, foreign fishermen, you know. Uh, Who's going to be out there to help the Coast Guard to alert them that, hey, there's somebody over here that shouldn't be in these waters and you need to get your Wakole over here to come do something about it. And so it really made me stop and think about that. I said, you know, yeah, that's a lot of area to cover. And if there is something um, that is amiss, you know, the fishermen are out there and, and they're the eyes and ears. And the Coast Guard can only do so much because they only have so much money and their, their coverage is very limited. So. I don't know, that was just one thing I think that I was struck by. It's like, you know, and she couldn't really answer the question uh, because I think, you know, there's a, the line that they're supposed to give. I mean, it's difficult, it's sensitive, but uh, it was an interesting point for me to even just, you know, just to consider coming away from that story. I, I personally try to uh, flip it. You know, if I'm going to be writing about the big macro thing, I turn it around and I go, well, let's start with the poke bowl. And it could be because I'm starting my story around lunchtime. And, I'm concerned about the cost of poke because I can hardly afford my habit as it is. And so, okay, let's look at that. Let's engage readers with that. They can relate with that. Okay. Then I back out from there and I'm like, okay, well, where, does that, where, does, where are those fish coming from? And what kind of decisions are being made about the management of those fish? And then oh, they're like, okay, now I care about that. And so that's, that's been my approach. <laughs> right. If someone has a story or if someone has information that they think would be a really cool segment in the show, a cool place to be. How do they get someone interested in that story? And any of you can answer that. Yeah, they just email. They'll, they'll email and they'll, they'll ask about, you know, if they can be on the show. And, and I remember uh, I got a phone call once and um, this guy named Isaac Rumajim asked me if I was interested in doing a story about kayak fishing. And I've been trying to do something like that. And I said, Oh yeah, he goes, then he all of a sudden he just hooked up, really? And he got all excited. I couldn't put a word in edgewise for the next three minutes. <laughs> but um, I don't know if you ever saw the uh, YouTube clip about Sharky and this kind of kayak that is pulling that fish up and the shark comes up and almost takes his fingers off. Well, that's Isaac. And, and Isaac, the, the day that we went out to go film him, it was just a natural. He would, he would go out and fish, talk about what he's doing, explain what he's thinking, and um, we just had a good time, and, and uh, he had just the greatest luck. He's had these baits down in the water, and he's fighting this one fish, and all of a sudden his other pole starts to bend. And here I'm trying not to laugh because now I'm thinking, okay, now you gotta double strike, there's only you in a kayak, what are you gonna do now? <laughs> and, and that was a story, and, and that was kind of his jumping off point to do some other stuff, but if nobody called, then I wouldn't know about it, and I'd, I'd never get the opportunity to do that. So people who are willing to share their stories and share their experience, that's what makes the show. So I tell people, Hawaii Goes Fishing is not my show, it's your show. It's about you. There's no on-camera host. I'm never in front of the camera. I'm behind the camera. These people are telling their own stories in their own way, and, and people get to watch how their day goes. So basically I'm a fly the wall observer and, and, and that's how you get that, that sense of being there out there with them and experiencing these things. And you hear their opinions and, and uh, their thoughts. Um, back in the 1980s, I, was a, uh, I just learned how to fly and my flight instructor told me, oh, if you want hours, here, go fly this guy named Carl. He, um, 
He needs pilots to help him look for a pulley along the Wainai coastline. So I was kind of new to fishing, and I really didn't know anything about up here fishing. So I get out there with Carl and getting the plane at about 2,000 feet, flying a circle for a school of pulley, and he gets He's radioing his boat down there, guy in a skiff, rowing, dropping 3,000 feet of net around his school. Then once that's done, the big boat goes in and busts the school into the net. And at the end of all of that, how much fish he gave? He goes, oh, about 500 pounds. He said, is it always like that? He goes, no, a few years ago it used to be 1,000 pounds. So I thought, okay, you were 1,000 pounds here. You're 500 pounds here. I'm thinking five years down the line, you'll be out of business. You'll run out of fish because you're taking all the fish. You're surrounding a whole school with this net, taking them all. 30 years later, he's taking up to 1,500 pounds of fish. He brings that into market. The market says, okay, we had enough. You, you can't take any more fish from you for the next couple of days. There's a cycle with the food, and it depends on the rain. Some days, it, you, get a, you get a year of good rain, Two years later, you get a bloom of a pulley, more than you can take in. I'm finding out now that that school consists of anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 pounds of fish. He was doing a research project where he had to fence and count to try and get an accurate count of how many fish there were. And in the process, some of the fish died. He had two boats. He loaded both boats with whatever fish they could take. He almost sank. And that's not the whole school. That's just a part of the school that died. And those Akuli, that Akuli school you, I saw, that's one of several just along the Waianae coast. That's how much Akuli there are. So when people say Hawaii is overfished, not Akuli, there is more Akuli than people in Hawaii can eat, and that's just along the Waianae coastline. So that's something that really changed my mind, that got me seeing things differently. They got me to understand that, okay, this, this resource is bigger than I had imagined. And then when I started talking to guys like Roy and Ed and Leonard, they're telling me about how other fisheries are, how the big eye fisheries are. You talk to Archie back there from Samoa, he'll tell you how the skipjack fishery is. It takes 400,000 pounds of skipjack to start his factory up. Would that wipe out the school? No, it's sustainable. Big eye fishing is sustainable. The 150,000 to 100,000 pounds of big eye that come into Pier 38 every single day, that's just half of what Hawaii eats, that's sustainable. And there's a lot of science that goes behind it. And that's something I'm learning about as a councilman with the West Pack. And it's something I've learned about just talking to a lot of these guys who are experts, including some of the scientists. And, and I try to get that across to other people as best I can. It's hard to change perceptions. But I think if you provide a good, balanced story, which is what I learned in journalism, you try and be as fair as you can and as honest as you can and as accurate as you can, and eventually some people will get it. Carrie, if somebody wants to get a story in Hawaii Fishing News, and they go, I got this, I got this great new lure, and you got to see what it is, um, how, would they, how would they go about that? But 
I've actually used social media to help me find some of those stories myself. And it's always fun when I go on Instagram or Facebook and see someone posting a story or even just a photo with their their catch and see. It's a really great photo, and it looks like you know it's a first of, that's the first of the year. They're a first, uh, you know, first of kind of fish in their life. And I say, well, that's the kind of story I really would like us to talk about in our magazine, or they go out with their family, and it's you know, it's a family fishing story. Please, those are the ones we really love to have and receive, and, and to highlight and uh, and get your voice and and have your family all go, wow, what's up? You guys are in the magazine. It's great. Like it, yeah, it's like being on the cover of Rolling Stone, right? right. Uh, the same thing, I mean, I'm looking here in the room and there's been a bunch of guys, uh, Ed uh, and, and, and others, uh, that have been in, the, I, I write a, a monthly column in Hawaii Boats and Yachts called The Buck Stops Here. It's always one of the council issues. And probably I get anywhere from 50 to 100 photos and stories submitted by email uh, uh, an issue. And like Jerry, we're like hungry birds in a nest. And the weirder the better. People like to know what's going on in the fishery. Uh, Ed, uh, I had a, a picture of Ed and his daughter and some ahi. And they asked, where did those guys catch that fish? Because it was a bonding deal between a father and a daughter with three big ahi on the boat. That didn't hurt. Same with, uh, with Ed. Ed has a photograph on one of the covers of Hawaii Fishing News years ago. The biggest wanaga that the world has ever seen. Either that or he was doing the stand right trick, holding it up close to the camera. That's a deal. You can take the little tiny small mouth bass and hold it really close like this, and it looks like a whale. But anyway, I, I think that all of us, whether it's Catherine at Public Radio or, or Paula at uh, KITV or me or Terry, anybody, we want your stories. Send them. That's, it's cannon fodder for what we do. We, we love that stuff. Stan. The key to success, whether it's radio, TV, newspaper, your friends and neighbors want to know what you're doing and what you're up to. And if you share it on Facebook, send it in the Hawaii Fishing What's it, Holo Holo page? Yep. I love that. Hawaii Fishing News, Holo Holo is our Facebook and Instagram. And that sells too, because Auntie's got to buy one, Grandma's got to buy one. Oh, it's great. About the magazine, though, which we have also, yes. The white Fishing News Holo Holo page in the magazine has been there for over 40 years, but now we're also on Instagram and Facebook. Same thing, white Fishing News Holo Holo. Nate and Catherine, if somebody has a news story that they want to have covered, and, or Catherine, an issue with fishing, what do they do and how do they get a hold of you? I have two suggestions there. I mean, if it's a news story that they're interested in a reporter covering, you can send it to any of our email addresses directly. Mine's Nate and it's civilbeat.com or news at civilbeat.com, not org now, I guess, but they both go to the same place. Or, alternatively, we have our community voices, kind of guest columns, which often are more well-read than our stories. A lot of interest there, and you can just email those to the same places. We'll make sure they get in the right hands. And because I made the transition from TV to radio, I know in TV we're always looking for the visuals. Uh, uh, for right now, for public radio, we have an hour show in the middle of the day and try and tackle issues of their fishery issues that you think are not getting as much coverage on commercial stations, you know, give us a call. Um, my email is ccruz at hawaiipublicradio.org or news at hawaiipublicradio.org. You know, shoot us an email, call us up. I mean, you know, we're open. But again, if it's a, an issue that maybe you think isn't getting uh, coverage needs, uh, you know, call public radio. And us at KITV, news at KITV, we'd love to hear uh, your concerns out there in the fishing community, in the fishing world, and also we'd love to see those awesome catches. Because we'll be like, we will troll Facebook looking for some of those really, really cool pictures. But if you send it to us, it's great. One of the things that I have seen back in, I guess it was 1980, Mike Sakamoto and I were fishing off Kaho Olavi in a boat, and we caught, each caught, same time, a five pound appeal. I had one, he had one. And we looked at those and Mike said, you know, if we turn this loose, it's going to be 10 pounds next year when we come back. Ready? One, two, three. And we dropped them in the water. Hate mail. Death threats <laughs> at the TV station. Channel 2 said, you guys want to release fish? That's fine. But do not do it on the camera. My God, you wouldn't believe the people calling. 
Now, over the years, Life Issue News, the newspaper, all these, all these guys, they've done stories on the tagging program for Papio and OEO, the scientific studies. Thank you guys in the science world that are doing these studies, and thank you media for publishing these things. And now I see kids catching and releasing. And Mike and I thought we would never see it in our lifetime. So the media, I'm, thank you. All right, thank you to our panelists. Now I'd like to open it up to you folks if you have any questions to our panelists about stories they've covered, stories you'd like to see, how they go about doing anything, ideas, feel free. Don't be shy. Rumor is the secret food at one was dog food and spam. <laughs> Did you hear that? He says rumor is dog food and spam was the secret food at Nuuanu Reservoir. Why, why did we never try an admission-based system to fishing at the reservoir if the concern was insufficient funds? Why didn't the state try to propose an admission fee to a state park? Here, here. You know, I don't think it, it was really an issue of not wanting to uh, have a, a recreational fishing place. It had more to do with the Coloco Dam and the threat to the community. And so that was one of the high hazard dams because if something were to happen, you look at the communities down below that would get flooded, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have great memories every summer going to New Orleans Reservoir. And it was very sad when, when they shut it down, but it had to do with dam safety more than anything. But I'm very sad there's no other place here on the water. Well, we could have been and that's catch and release, but, um, you know, it was town. It was just like, it's great. You just go back in the valley, and you, know, you don't even know you're right by the Pony Highway. I love that place. I've got a, one of those wildlife feeders and filled it up with dog food and hung it from a tree up at Lake Wilson. Within three days, three days, I could go up there and just drive the boat under, throw a handful of dog food. You could see 20, 30 feet away these big catfish coming and the tilapia, the red devils, and they get excited. The bass, the peacock bass. It worked, it was great for three, four months. And I was telling everybody, oh, we love this, we just take the kids. And then somebody stole the little feeder. I have no idea what happened to it. But yeah, just throw a handful of dog food in the water, same time every day, and they'll come around. You know, I'm not a fisherman, but my mom is from Missouri, and they have big catfish in Missouri. <coughs> And I have pictures of my grandfather, and that's what he used. He used dog food. And I have this faded black and white picture of my grandfather and my uncles. And they've got a kid's swing set, and the catfish are hanging from the swing set, and they're touching the ground. They were just huge. And that's what that he swore by the dog food. <laughs> it works in salt water, too. Although, as a swimmer, I know when I've been out swimming. <laughs> um, and we've seen uh, a number of these uh, tour boats. And uh, I've seen some dog food. But they, you know, the fish get trained. You throw the food in the water, and all the fish come, and then all the tourists get all happy because there's lots of fish, and they can take pictures. But yeah, when you're in the water, you, you don't want to see the big fish. They go, get the little fish. <laughs> Remember the green peas, that, the frozen green peas at Hanaba Bay, what was that, 30, 40 years ago? They stopped that, yeah. But man, you talk about catching Himalaya and stuff in Conroe Bay. Oh yeah, yeah frozen corn, green peas, carrots, and all over. <laughs> Here, here's another one for you. Um, as Dean knows, and I think Jerry knows, because her dad and I used to visit each other almost every day on the marina in Hawaii Kai. At that time, I had a commercial Cooley operation when it's when I was working with these two other ladies at KITV. They didn't know that. We caught a coolie every day. I have this one Hawaiian guy that every day went to Love's Bakery in the, and got a, the old bread. And every afternoon at about four o'clock he'd come over to my house, crumple up this bread, and throw it in the marina. And the mullet and the aba and everything would come. And I thought that was so nice. He'd feed the fish, feed the fish, feed the fish. This went on for about a month. Then he brought this big bag with him. And he had the bag of breadcrumbs. And when there was about 200 fish, 
eating this bread is when he threw his throw net. <laughs> he needed to pay for the throw net. So he fed the fish for a month so he could catch the mullet and then pay for his net. And he never came back. He never did that again. But that's why when we talk about rules and regulations, I always bring up that story because every fish got used. They didn't release any, they had a phone, they'd get on the phone and they'd say, mullet. And all one of us, I think Uncle Roy has heard this many times too. How many of you fishermen come back from a couple of days fishing and you call up somebody and say, hey, we got some mai mai, you want some, come get it. Oh, can you deliver it? Can you take out all the bones? Can you clean it? And hey, why don't you just cook it and drop it off there? Every fish gets taken. I know that one of the things that Roy Marioka, my dear friend for over 65 years, we grew up together. We, eat, we, we live to fish and we, we, we eat what we catch. And that's what this group, that's why you are different from fishermen throughout the country. Because it's not only a pastime here, it's food. You know, for, for those of you who are heavy into the fishing, I know with Hokulea, as, as we took her around the world, we came to like areas that, when, when I talked to the guys on the canoe who are fishermen, they were, they were really dead spots. Where they threw out lines, and they threw out lines, and they threw out lines, and nothing, like not a bite for days in different areas of the world. How worried are you about acidification and some of the other things that they could talk about in climate change? Well, just a quick thing about throwing out lines and not catching anything. I was out with Ed Watamura uh, on by, I think it was uh, Pibui, kind of near Molokai. And we caught a few fish, you know, troll, troll all day. It's one of those things where you leave at dark, come back at dark. And didn't come back whitewashed, but didn't load the food either. And then the next day, I get this email from David Tano. He did the tuna tagging study. He was out there servicing the buoy, replacing the transponder. And he sent this picture, and under that buoy was loaded with fish. There's just all these fish, just that nothing bit. And that's one of those things that happens. You know, you, you go out, you, you throw your line out, and, and nothing happens. I go out man fishing, and you can see all these fish on the depth sounder, and you're working, and you're working, and working, do everything you can, and they're just not interested. And sometimes they'll bite, sometimes they won't. But um, regarding the ocean acidification thing, um, yeah, something's got to be done. Um, I know that uh, you know, there's both sides to that whole thing with the uh, carbon dioxide um, uh, levels in the Earth's atmosphere, and that's already been measured and known. Um, there's definitely signs of global warming, and um, uh, there's a bunch of things that will cause that acidification. You get the acidification, a lot of these uh, things like shrimp and whatnot, they require um, a certain pH level in the water, otherwise their shells don't form properly. Same with coral, it doesn't form properly. So we need to take steps now that even if global warming is something that's a natural occurrence, um, as the old saying goes, if you're walking on eggs, don't cry. Don't do stuff to make it worse. Keep it from getting worse. Other questions from the audience? So you, when, when you uh, read about uh, steak dinners, for example, that's We're going to give you that microphone real quick. Yeah. When, you, when you read about <coughs> people enjoying steak dinners, it, that's not immediately followed by uh, some sort of uh, complaint about the meatpacking industry or, or how bad uh, it is when, when cattle are raised in certain ways with clones. But when you read stories about the tuna industry, you know, it seems like there's almost an immediate bias against the industry. They start talking about the unfortunate people who uh, are from Micronesia working on these spears and, and, and can't uh, access uh, regular uh, facilities or, or regular life while they're here. And, and it seems like uh, even though Pokey is now uh, an international um, cuisine, people are everywhere you go, you read about people enjoying Pokey. It seems like there's a continual drumbeat that the commercial fishing industry is why is bad. And it's not just bad from the standpoint of the environment, but maybe even morally questionable. And when, when you read stories in the, 
that are in the AP and the Washington Post and the New York Times, and, and they talk about why it always seems like the science is sanctuaries are good, fishing is bad, but we still like to eat fish. How do you respond to that narrative? Yeah, okay, for, um, let's backtrack a little bit. That story about um, slavery, that originated from the Associated Press. Now, Associated Press is a news agency. And so what they do is they have all these different newspapers and television stations, radio stations, who are subscribers to this agency. So a story like that comes along, and basically they'll pick it up, and they'll publish it. Every once in a while, a news organization will look at it and go, well, let's dig a little deeper. So what KHUN did is they went to one of the long line boats, and then they talked to a couple of the um, crew members, the people who they claimed were trapped on the boats, locked away, and enslaved. Well, here's the way it works. Long line fishing is a very hard job. It's worse than when I worked at the cannery, because at the end of the day, you're not going to go home. It takes at least six hours to deploy 3,000 hooks. It takes another 12 hours to retrieve this million dollars worth of hardware and to recover an unknown quantity of very high value fish. And you're going to make a dozen or more sets like that. You're looking at an 18 hour day. You're not going to get a break because you can't stop. You're going to get a six hour break. The next day you're going to start all over again. And it's like that every single day. They tried to get some college students to do it, and some college students figured, okay, you know, it's easy money, you go out and fish, have fun, and at the end you get paid all this money. Which is true, but you're looking at an 18-hour day on a boat that's rocking and rolling. If, you're ten, if, you, if you had a tendency to get seasick, you're going to have the worst time in your life, and more often than not, you'll do one voyage and quit, that's it, pop, done. And so now the skipper has to find another crew. And the only people who are willing to work that hard, because they work that hard all the time from where they came, are people from Vietnam, from Philippines, from Samoa. And for them, it's the same hard work, same long days, but now they're getting paid a share of the cash. And then when they go home, that share of the cash is worth, to them, a lot of money because the cost of living there is so low. They end up buying their family a house or other members of their family, a house. Um, there was one incident where one of those crewmen was coming back to Honolulu and he called a friend of mine who, who works with him a lot. And he said, hey, um, I'm gonna come through and we're, you know, we're on our way to vacation. But well, where are you going? London. They're, again, their cost of living is so low that what, what this guy earned over doing multiple contracts, multiple two-year contracts, set his family up for life. And that's what we here don't understand because our cost of living is different, our work ethic is different. Um, I think um, we never get to hear the other side of the story, what this work means to them, how they value um, getting paid what they do, and, and the fact that in the fishing industry there's no such thing as an hourly wage, there isn't. You get a share of the catch. It depends on which boat you work for, what your base rate might be, and what your catch share might be. And it depends on what your job was as to what your catch share might be. It was that way with it's that way with long liners. It was that way with the aqua boats way back when. And I think you can ask some of the old time aqua boat guys how much they got paid. Um, and they got paid well. I think they yeah, I just had a couple of things. I would agree with you, too. I think that was really well said. Um, one thought that came to mind is journalists by the nature, especially investigative journalists, are just prone to take a critical look at whatever it is. And so we'll keep harping on that. And so like in Ohio, like I actually did look at meatpacking industries and mega farms and things like that that are there. And this kind of seconds what Mike was saying earlier, you know, with uh, the guy with the nest that got busted a couple times in a row recently, uh, it's one you know bad apple that needs to be out, and then it, it gives the whole industry a bad name. Same kind of thing for for me in Ohio. It was a kid had actually drowned in one of the manure, the ponds, you know, 
And so it's like, what, ha what kind of safeguards are here and around that? that? That's terrible. And I think, I'm assuming anyway, AP, same thing. It was really just the one fisherman, right, that got busted. In that case, it was just settled. So I don't know if that helps a little bit. Yeah, I'm glad to hear Nate say that for two things. First of all, Dean and I have spent many, many hours on this subject. I actually interviewed a guy from the Philippines when I was in the Philippines on assignment. And this guy was a long-line fisherman for 11 years. It was a covenant job that he wouldn't give up. And a result of his hard work out of Honolulu Harbor, bought six taxi cabs for his family in Manila. He's an independent taxi driver employing 20 people off the back of a fishing boat. Now, the only thing that irritated me about that particular story, about the slave conditions and the slavery was, the real story was about a boat that was grounded, and what was going to be done by the state, by the insurance companies, by the salvage guys, to get that boat off the reef before it did permanent ecologic, you know, environmental damage. But every single time those AP writers wrote about that, the second half of it was about slavery. I get it. Three weeks later, I get it. I want to know what's being done to get the boat off the reef. You know, and that's the, that's the thing that, there's a lot of people in this room that know these things already, but those that don't, even the reporters, we got so many people saying, well, why don't they arrest those guys? The fishermen that did what they did, and the people that came up on that boat at a cost of about four grand a piece to get here to go fishing, they're not breaking the law, they're taking advantage of the law. And if you want that area changed, whether you're an AP writer or whether you're somebody that's anti-fishery, you gotta get your legislators to change the law. Until the law is changed, these guys aren't doing anything except making a living, I think. If I can add, uh, on that particular story, I remember uh, talking to the uh, immigration folks, and they said, yeah, they checked the patient's papers, and they were fine, and you know, they let them go. But I do remember a case where there was, um, it was a murder on a fishing ship, a fishing boat, and I remember it, uh, the story that came out in you know, the affidavits, and said the guy that killed the captain, he was a farmer. You know, and he got sucked into, you know, he didn't get the job he promised. He got stuck on a fishing boat, you know, for a really Shanghai. long time. Yeah, that's Shanghai, you know, and so it does happen. And there is, uh, you know, there are other stories out there. And uh, whether it's uh, a guy on a fishing boat or Chinese construction workers that get brought to Saipan to work on a, cas a casino and, you know, on a tourist visa and then they're worked to death and they have a construction accident and they aren't taken to the hospital. You know, and what happened to that Chinese man? You know, and these are real people out there. And so, you know, you can't just use a broad brush and say, oh yeah, it's all, all the fishermen are, are, are slaves. But, you know, it does happen up there. And so you just have to keep an eye out for, you know, when you see it to throw light on it. All right, we have a question. Uh -huh, thank you. <clears throat> Um, I'm from Saipan, and I've probably been in the environmental field for about 46 years. Um, I, I wanted to make a comment about environmental journalism. Um, in my earlier days, when I was younger, I never talked to journalists. Uh, they seemed to always get the story short, uh, long. Um, I was working in research. Uh, fisheries research is not easy. It's, it's extremely difficult to convey the details of fishery research management to somebody that doesn't have a background. And for people like me that don't have, excuse <clears throat> me, that doesn't have a good background, it's even harder. But I've seen over time environmental journalism degrade to the point where all I see are environmental advocates. It was absolutely amazing the stories that I had read during the monuments in the, in the Marianas, here in Hawaii, it appears that the all, I shouldn't say that, it appears that many of the journalists simply became mouthpieces of the Impute Environment Group, Oceana, and the other NGOs. Journalists were taking what they were being fed with a spoon, repeating it like parrots. And I have read stories that are absolutely wanting to make me throw up. It was amazing, the wrong information. And, and information that is being relayed to the public in that the reader infers the wrong conclusion. 
that makes us mad. It makes me not want to talk to you. I have finally turned around. I'm trying to talk and be nice to journalists. But in Saipan, I have two journalists that I will talk to if they let me read their story before it goes to press. Now, that was tough, but they give me a 15-minute window as their editor is reading it for me to look over. I don't try to change it, but what I try to do is I try to correct the facts in the story to make the story more readable. And it just, I, I, I don't know what to do, but I see it time and time again. And quite honestly, the Pew Environment Group, Oceana, and those other NGOs are well-organized media. They have control of the media. I don't know how they do it. They pay people 40 hours. They, they hire people to do nothing but disseminate environmental news. And bottom line, it's anti-fishing. And I, I just, I, I, I applaud the journalists coming here to this group because I don't know how many other people feel the same way I do, but I just don't have a lot of respect for journalists and environmental journalists as anymore. And, I am, and I'm really sorry to say that. But until we can actually start getting a bias, an unbiased view of environmental issues and fishing issues, you're not going to change people's mind. And you're not going to get the courtesy from people that have the other side of the story talking to you because they don't trust you. And I appreciate you letting me get this off my chest because this has been boiling now for about 10 years. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, there's, there's a number of factors involved in something like that. Um, I got a degree in journalism back in 1979 or 1980, and I spent 24 years in the newspaper business as a photographer, but I was also a writer for um, some small publications. And um, of course, you know, I talk to the editors and reporters all the time. Um, part of that adv advocacy journalism is partly because of editors who have an idea of what it is that they want in a paper. And, and I, I've seen it in, um, even at the major daily I worked at, which was a star bulletin. It wasn't often, but sometimes it would happen where an editor, mid-level editor, will insist that a reporter see something a certain way, even when the reporter calls back to the newsroom and says, that's not what's happening. And the editor goes, no, I know this is happening this way, so go check on it. And if the reporter doesn't stand his or her ground, that's how it'll go. The, the other problem is that um, nobody can know everything. And oftentimes you'll get a general assignment reporter who suddenly sent to go cover something that's really complicated. One of my favorites was uh, because I have a strong interest in it is aviation. And they will start writing about something like, oh, you know, the plane slammed into the mountain because it was flying under visual flight rules. And he's thinking, well, it's, it, it should have been flying instrument flight rules because it's safer. And I said, no, you, visual, you have visual flight rules. There are rules that say you do not fly an airplane into the clouds and that's how you don't hit mountains. You follow the rules, you stay safe. But without understanding how things work and what things are, um, sometimes reporters may jump to a conclusion and follow that trail. Um, what needs to happen in that case is that, um, for one thing, they should ask the right questions of the right people. And sometimes they won't know that. And so it is up to the people in whatever industry, in this case the fishery industry, to go out, reach out, and try to help educate journalists in what it is they do and what it all means. And with that better understanding, we'll probably come, come uh, better journalism, better stories, better balance, fair, something that will take both sides into account.
It's, it's going to be biased one way or the other. It's, it's human nature, you can't help it. But at least if, an editor, if a reporter and the editor is conscientious enough, it will be fair and it will be as humanly accurate as possible. And they will let the reader make up their minds about the, the subject. I actually love that, and I agree with Dean entirely. Uh, I, I get how you have that experience, and it's, that's unfortunate, um, <laughs> but I totally can appreciate how it's happened. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, one, I mean, environmental journalism is obviously incredibly important. It's how we have stories like Flint, Michigan, like knowing that that water is poison. That's something I think we all should care about. Uh, one thing, this kind of goes back to an earlier question about, you know, how could the council assist and how can they help our journalism be better. One thing they've done that's been really helpful to me is making their scientists available for me to ask them over and over all these dumb questions until I have a firm grasp of it. So I, I'm constantly bugging people like Eric Kingma and all those at home to uh, get the facts right. And so I'll never agree to show my story before it publishes because it's against a whole bunch of code of ethics that journalists follow nationally. But I will, if I have any doubt on a piece of fact or any, I will run that back by the source. I'll say, hey, I just want to make sure I heard this right. I want to make sure I'm interpreting it right before we share this with a bunch of people. And the mistakes can still happen. That's fine, too. That's another reason why I'm 100% open to correcting a story like, and as quickly as possible. It's one of the views we have of at least being online. We don't have to let that fact stay there incorrect, and then it gets perpetuated. So I also encourage readers all the time, like, hey, you know, that's not quite right. You know, you've got to check that out. Fortunately, that happens very, very little. But um, I don't know, just a couple other comments to. Well, I could just add, I think, um, if it's a mistake about a fishery story or a scientific story or, or whatever, a, a political issue, just call us out, you know? Because um, what I've learned over the years is with social media, you know, if something goes online, uh, the time to correct it is, you know, after it's online, because then that gets snatched up and carried, you know, all over the world, and you've got this horrible, glaring error, and it gets repeated and repeated, and it's like, oh my God, if someone had just said, hey, your article's wrong on online, you know, and then we'll try and make the correction, or, uh, you know, just call us out on it, but the quicker you let us know we made a mistake, the better. You know, and that's kind of, I'd like to piggyback on that, something that Nathan said, and also something that our friend from Saipan said. What you have to do, first of all, every one of us is under deadlines and under guns. We have to produce, we have to get the story out there, gauge the response, tell our sponsors that we're doing a good job, give us more money so that we can go out and do more stories. If you can go online and correct something, once it gets out, whether it's on a radio show like mine, you get out there, it's really hard to suck it back in. So you have to suck in your pride, and you have to understand that being the first to believe this sometimes is not good because it's fake news. And one thing that the Saipan guy said, which we all have to consider is, where is the source? Everybody in the Pew organization or any other environmental group, they wake up every morning thinking they're doing the right thing. And they disseminate the information they have. But you also have to understand that they are beholden to their donors. They're beholden to this foundation and that foundation. They've got to produce the stories where these guys are going to write these big checks. And that's what's happening to us now with regard to the monument. So hopefully there's going to be some balance and the current administration can tweak what needs to be tweaked. I mean, the monuments are a great idea, but you know what I mean? You, if you run with the story, like if I run with the story tomorrow and I'm done with in the morning, tomorrow morning from 6 to 9, I'll make mention to this day, or this evening, and I'll say, boy, I learned this from a guy in Saipan that hates the media because every source he has is tainted. And I don't think anybody at this table wants to be known as a tainted source. I <laughs> I've read some of those stories too. And there and I've even seen people comment on them on social media to some extreme positions. Some people say that they believe that they're sent by or written by lobbyists for PETA or vegetarian organizations and, and that type of thing. And, and I don't know if that's really true. But it shows that people feel that some of the journalism is written by emotion and values rather than science. And that's not right. And especially when our politicians are making decisions based on emotions and not on science. So I think that's what we're going to right now. I think we had right there. <laughs> hey, uh, this has been the best uh, panel of uh, Fisher's one I've been to in a 
a long time, so thanks everyone. But I just kind of, uh, the last two questions, um, I kind of wanted to, to press the panel a, a little bit harder and bring it back. Um, with regard to uh, what John, the last, the last question, I feel like uh, some of the responses went into, well, you know, we're, we're always uh, willing to uh, correct a mistake, or we do listen to our, our, our readership. But I'd like to hear a little bit more of what you guys think about uh, what was brought up by really both questions, and that's kind of a, a, a prevailing uh, inherent bias, to use uh, your words and anything, sort of against fishing. And uh, in particular, I'm thinking about uh, the longline fishery and uh, some of the issues uh, that have uh, come up in the media the last year or so in that. And uh, so I'd like to I'd like to hear more about that. Is, is that real? And uh, and maybe uh, Nathan, I was really interested in what you said about. It seems to me I, what I'm hearing is kind of the role of the investigative journalist is to dig and, and to press, and I, and I do appreciate that. And the, like the Flint, Michigan, you know, I'm just watching that Netflix series. I, I really do appreciate the value of investigative reporting. At the same time, I, I would ask you, um, and then to tie it back and just maybe combine all the million questions I, I, I have. Um, you know, so is it the, so that's the role of the investigative journalist. Is it really, like, so is there another role that's, if there is an inherent, sort of a, a prevailing bias, is there somebody else not fulfilling their role in the opposite and equal uh, extent to which the investigative journalist is? Um, and then, you know, uh, it's like a balancing mechanism? It, 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 right. It's, it, so, it, you know, the question was, is there this prevailing bias? Yes or no? If, if yes, or if no, well, particularly if yes, because I, I, I kind of feel like there might be, uh, what's the solution to that? If, does the investigative journalist need to uh, investigate the other side? I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I don't know. But, um, and then finally, I mean, to, to specifically, if we're going to talk about an issue, um, yeah, you know, like the monument or the uh, the foreign crew issue. Nathan, you said that uh, you know there were some bad apples and that uh, the case was settled. Um, how, how did that play out? Uh, was that was it a good thing? How do you see your know, reporting on the issue? How did that? Uh, do you feel like that was part of the uh, positive outcome, a negative outcome? Uh, what was the cost? Uh, and then uh, if I could just lump one more on. Uh, Where's this uh, long line fishery of ours going? Uh, you know, the last year or so, or a year, you know, whatever frame you're looking at, it's been kind of uh, kind of brutal in the press, I feel like. And uh, I'd be curious to uh, see what what you guys think is good about it. Um, has that been covered? What's bad about it? Uh, and then uh, where's it all headed? I'll shut up. <laughs> I'm not even sure exactly where to jump in on that, but I'll give it a shot. Speak up. <laughs> but I do appreciate your questions and comments, although I apologize ahead of time if I don't answer all of them, but I'll try. Um, speaking of the bias point of view, um, when it was brought up that you know, some of these stories can paint the industry negatively, I kind of think to what Kathy has said, like, you know, and I'm, I don't want to speak too much for AP because I, I didn't write that story about the slave, slavery issue and stuff like that. I did do some of my own follow-ups. Um, that story needs told. It absolutely needs told because those are real lives and real people living in those situations. What's hard is that for the investigative journalists, that's kind of where it stops. Okay, you've unearthed that. It, like I said, it's been settled, it's done, it's good. But their job isn't to be PR then for the entire industry. And that's, that's hard, that's problematic. Uh, I'm not saying that it should change, but I can totally appreciate how that can paint the industry negatively. You can try to, I guess, um, just think up time, and try to be more, I don't know, clear with your readers that this is this is one case. This isn't the whole thing. Don't paint with broad brush books, that kind of thing. Um, what would you, some of your other questions? Um, like kind of where do I see the industry heading? That's it's really not for me to <laughs> speculate on. It sounds like things are getting better. Uh, the fish are, are no longer being overfished as much, and, um, or at all even anymore. It's being sustainable. Uh, at least the science, I think is about 77% sure on that. I was talking to Eric and that they're going to be following up on that science and we'll see if it gets confirmed. And I'll be tracking that, of course. 
Uh, so that's that's a strong sign. I think the Western Pacific um, Central Pacific Fisheries <laughs> Commission uh, gave them another few hundred uh, pound, few hundred tons actually of big eye to be able to catch it. That's to me that's a positive sign. Uh, at the end of the day, what, what do I want? I think that was part of your question too. I want you know good, well sourced, um, affordable if possible. Okay. I think I mentioned my addiction. Um, Tomorrow's is located right across the street from my office, so I'm like kind of set up. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I hope that answers some of them. Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely does. And if I, I could can just uh, push back a tiny bit sure. uh, before the rest of the panel. But uh, um, the, you said that it's kind of not the job. You know, your job really isn't to be uh, the mouthpiece of the uh, another side. But I was wondering, how and if maybe you have to reconcile with sort of feeling like the mouthpiece of the other side, sort of the, uh, you know, the organizations that were mentioned in, in the two previous questions. Yeah, let me take a swing at that only because since you talked about that story, what was the real story about that Pacific Paradise running up on the reef was that it couldn't come in at night to the harbor because it had all these, these migrant fishermen on it. It couldn't be inspected by the Department of Immigration because they don't work at night. So they had to hold two off Waikiki. That was the real story. That's what happened. The guy fell asleep or something, ran into the reef. And like, like Nathan was saying, it was an AP story. And the real caveat here was one of the writers, a gal, highly recognized, highly respected journalist, award-winning. And she put her name to this story, which would indicate to almost anybody reading, well, she's an award-winning journalist. This must be the truth. And it was the truth, I guess, as she saw it. But every single story that came out after that, this way he would be back in the press talking the slavery thing again. And all of us got sort of irritated by it. So I can understand why somebody reading it said, where are you listening to? Are you listening to the funding of the, of the other guys? And I guess my job is to try to get through that and say, and I've done this, where I get on the radio and say, you know what? Last week I was telling you about this guy that beat up this guy and he should be in jail. I was wrong. He wasn't the one that was beaten up. He got beaten up. So I'm, I'm wrong about that. I think all of us have had the opportunity every now and again to say, fans, readers, boy, I pulled the boner on that story. Here's the, real, here's the reality of it. And that's what makes most of us, I think, here a little bit different than people that are funded by organizations that have an agenda. And there's not a whole lot of there's, there's not a whole lot of investigative journalism going on anymore. Uh, you, know, you see the newspapers closed, televisions, uh, stations are freaked out because people aren't watching TV anymore. And, you know, the whole social media thing is just in this major upheaval. So there, there are not a lot of good places that you can go to to get good information. You know, civil beat, you know, in terms of uh, void. This community and watch the newspapers uh, fold and merge, same with the TV stations. So we don't have the staff that we did not even five years ago. I mean, that's the sad part, I think, is that we don't have journalists out there. We've got people that are flipping things really quick because there are a lot of pressure to turn a story around and, and this is an easy get. And, you know, they'll make some half hearted attempt or some attempt to get the other side, but, you know, reality is they don't have the time and resources to do a really good job. So if you see that they made a mistake, just I would say just call them out on it, correct it as soon as possible. Um, it's sad to say, yeah, it's sad to say it turns into Mike, I'm really glad you brought up the case of the Pacific Paradise because that's exactly what I'm talking about. Where was the story with that? A, a, a long line of wash up on the reef, and yet in every uh, pickup by every major outlet, a, a rehashing of uh, slave labor in Hawaii. And so that's what I mean uh, when journalists uh, become the mouthpiece of a, of a sign. That's that's a real problem. So so what's that? What's that? Mean? You know, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, probably to beat on a similar drum. And, and, and Catherine, this one's maybe a little bit directed at Hawaii Public Radio. And, I, and I'm a member. But I'm glad I live on the Big Island now because I'll tell you, when Dave Warren starts to talk about some of these issues, I have to pull over. I find myself yelling at the radio like a crazy person, saying, where do you get your poke? Because I think it's, we're focusing a lot on, well, if we get the facts wrong, just call us out. Just let us know. Nobody wants to get the facts wrong. It's not a facts issue. 
I don't have a factual problem with a lot of the things that I read in Civil Beat or I read in HBR, I'm listening to HBR. It's, it's set in a much more nuanced and complex story. I would rather get my fresh bouquet, you know, and Nathan, you go to Tours, they got great bouquet, but a lot of it's gas, a lot of it's carbon monoxide, a lot of it. Um, I'd rather pay more to know that our fleet is under a lot of regulations that other fleets aren't. I'd rather pay a lot to know that although we catch sea turtles, a lot of them are released alive, and there's thousands of them on the beaches of Mexico being slaughtered. I'd rather reward our fresh fishery, and I'm not a shill for the industry, and I get that there's problems in fisheries. I get that there's problems in the National Fisheries Service. I get that there's problems in the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council. But it's set in a much larger context and story, and I don't ever get that from what I'm listening to and reading some of these stories. I get slave labor, I get um, you know sea turtles, I get I get being sued by Earth Justice again. I, I get sort of one set of facts, which are very factual, but I don't get a lot of context that would make me go, oh, well, I guess, knowing that information, I'm still going to eat poke okay from the white online fishery, because what's my alternative? I, I don't get that. I, that's, that was, you know, I got home, talked to my wife a few months ago, and I heard yet another Dave Lawrence kind of diatribe about it. I said, I'm going to write a letter. I'm, you know, I'm a member. I'm going to write a letter, because I, I want to hear more of the context that gives listeners the bigger picture that this is all said, and that's just my, that, that's just really my monotone on all of this, and I think a lot of people kind of circled around this. The, the, the bigger picture is important. Political correctness. You say something like that, you argue with them, you get beat up and kicked down. If you're not doing what's politically correct and following that lead story, you get killed. I think there's a lot of that politically correctness that's keeping people from standing up to a lot of these people that maybe do the <coughs> call it false journalism or Yellow uh, journalism. fake news. <laughs> and I think, you know, for decades, I've seen in Hawaii anyway, and it's probably in other places, there is kind of a different gangs of fishermen, the international longliners. There's the local commercial fishermen, and then there's the non-commercial fishermen. And so often we are pitted against each other, and there's all kinds of misinformation in order for one side to feel that they're getting in on the other side to win more of their territory back, particularly the local commercial fishermen. They really feel that the longliners are infringing on them, and then they have reasons sometimes to complain about the, the shortcasters, or the, just even the regular non-commercial non fishermen. Like, now why aren't we working together? Now I do feel that there's been a lot more clarity in regards to the law miners, there's a lot more rules and regulations. They are doing the violations that they were doing 20 years ago all over the Pacific. I mean, it used to be horrendous. Um, and I would hear from fishermen in Tuvalu that would say, we don't even have any more fish anymore because the Japanese law mine fishing fleet came through and we are completely depleted. Uh, that doesn't happen like it used to happen. But there is still those bad feelings. And again, it comes down to science and, and policy versus emotion. And a lot of those emotions, like any gang warfare, does not just disappear. And there are policies and, and people that are pushing political agendas that don't necessarily have to do with reality. And you have journalists that are hearing those things. And they're, and they're resonating, they're not quite sure what, what is the truth versus the feeling uh, and the historical resonance that happens and the bad feelings that happen. But that's one thing that I think, at least I know I do, and I think all the journalists at this table, we are trying to get at more transparency to those relationships so that we can clear the debris and get closer and closer to finding the right decisions and how to work in partnership together and not be beating each other up and defeating the fishing industry on behalf of the PETA industry or whoever it is. I want to hear your question because I know you've been waiting. Okay, well, I have a question. If you hear a story, it comes out on the AP, does it just get regurgitated because the AP is like the internet, you heard on the internet, so it must be true? Or is there some degree of research, especially if it's a local story, such as like that boat that went on the reef to Pacific Paradise? I mean, all the entities that were supposed to know where that foreign crew was, knew of where there was. The border patrol, the boat owner, the captain, so uh, everyone appeared to know where they were, but the journalists, whoever was investigating this, they asked the state 
with nothing to do with the coup. They asked uh, one of our representatives, one of the legislator, and he spun it, you know, how he wanted to. So I, the question is, you know, is the AP, if it comes with the AP, is it taken as the holy grail and it just to be sent out? It's, it's kind of hard not to do that. You know, you, you, work at a, you work at a newspaper, for example, and and you just think that, well, if it came through AP, it must have been vetted. And more often not, than not, it is. Usually it's from a very good source, from a very careful writer, and it'll, it'll, you know, what they're reporting is as accurate as they can get. But every once in a while, things get missed, things get messed up. The New York Times was hit because there was a guy who made up a story. Of, of all people, the New York Times, you think they'd be the most credible source. You think they'd, they'd fit every single thing, and they usually do. But sometimes stuff gets through the cracks, and that's how stuff like that happens. Um, Carrie mentioned something, and I, I really agree with her. Um, there's a lot of factions in the fishery between commercial, non-commercial, and every, everything in between. And, and really, um, everybody has to stand together. There's been a lot of villainizing of the commercial fishing industry. And what people have got to realize is that if it weren't for commercial fishermen, there would be absolutely no seafood in the stores at all. A lot of guys fish here, yeah. A lot of guys do different kind of fishing. Some guys cannot get a certain kind of fish. Like, some people can't catch the better. So where do you find that? Maybe in the in market if you're lucky. Some guys can't get big eye. And even if you could, are you going to eat the whole big eye? No. You're going to end up breaking it up into blocks and giving it to friends. Or you go to a store and get it. We eat so much seafood in this state that the 140 long line boats bringing in somewhere between 25 to 50 tons of fish a day cannot even meet half of that demand. And the other half is frozen imported stuff. We can't keep up. A thousand pounds of upli every two or three days. That can't. That that's all that the market can take because people don't want to eat fish with bones in it. But you take all of these things, the three hundred thousand pounds of bottom fish that a bottom fish fishery brings in. All of that is not enough, and it's something we depend upon. So number one, I would ask that everyone. <coughs> give a lot more reverence to people who fish commercially. They're, they're not the greedy fishermen. They're not catching all these fish and keeping it. They're bringing it to market. They're, they're providing it so the rest of us who can't fish, especially people like me, can actually get to eat fish. Tutu and Tutukane, they can get fish because of a commercial fishing. All right, thanks, Dave. We've got time for just two more questions, and we have the two Gentlemen waiting, you in the back. Uh, so this question is a little uh, off topic from what we've been talking about, but maybe a good change of subject. Um, I wanted to ask if a couple of you could maybe share a story within relation to commercial recreational fishing that in particular to an upcoming generation of new fishermen, whether those are recreational or commercial fishermen, a story that's maybe garnered support or had the community excited about getting out and fishing. You know, I think that's a big part of fishing media is not just the bad stories or the issues with commercial industries, but also the stories that get people out to support fisheries and get people out fishing. Let me start with that one. I think it's, it's kind of apropos because I just did a program on this uh, with, the, with the council. As Carrie was mentioning earlier, some of these things that were going on 20, 30 years ago aren't anymore in far-reaching vast areas of the Pacific because of the council. This is the 172nd meeting of this group. Uh, there's eyes and ears of literally tens of thousands of people throughout the Pacific that because of the council's effort are transporting information to one another all the time. And that's why some of the bad guys are gone. But I think that with regard to your question though is that if you take a look at wpcouncil.org and you take a look at the programs and the mentoring and the scholarships that are available, it's a privilege to work in the fishing industry. It's like Dean was saying, we're only getting ourselves 55% of the fish that we need. So we need more fishermen. And it's an honorable profession. I, just as a real quick aside, how many of you know about 
the series on television, Wicked Tuna. Anybody watch this or Wicked Tuna? I had Captain Dave um, on this, this last week on my show. They're just like us. They are highly regulated. The number of bluefin they can catch is right down to the day in the pound. And they realize, and like, I think it was, Stan was saying earlier, when, the, when they got death threats for releasing the papillo, okay? These guys, when they see this fish come up the back of the boat, they can see if it's 73 inches or not, and they let them go by the thousands. How many guys in Hawaii, if they catch a 73 inch big eye or yellow fin, are gonna let it go? So we have a lot to learn from that, but by the same token, in answer to your question, there are plenty of opportunities in the fishery and going to WPCouncil.org for somebody who wants to know about that's a good start. Any other stories that, that you think really speak to the this next generation of upcoming upcoming fishermen? There's so many, but one I'll just say is this is the, the new generation of women fishermen. And uh, all I fishing is certainly is going to be, and I'm, I'm you know, helping my dad transition. So uh, that's certainly going to be a focus that I want to bring to Hawaii. And uh, we're going to be having more clinics specifically for women fishers and, uh, and focusing more on them as, as we grow. Because we know, many of them want to know how to do it better or how to do it at all. Uh, and they are just as passionate about it as their men folk. And uh, so we're certainly looking at doing that. All right, we have a question right there. Uh, not a question. I just want to know that it seems like in much of this discussion, what we're dealing with is really a manifestation of Grandolini's law. And that law states that it takes 10 times as much effort to refute bullshit as it takes to make it in the first place. <laughs> okay, and now we have our final question. Hi, my name is Carly Sanchez, and I just turned 18. Um, I went to a journalism camp last year and um, the creator of C-SPAN, Brian Lamb, um, asked us, what's your political party? And everyone immediately raised their hands and shouted, Democrat, Republican. And I'm sitting here like, that's not what we're supposed to do, guys. <laughs> we're not supposed to tell anyone we're, <laughs> we're at journalism camp. Um, so he immediately told everyone that they were wrong. And if you guys watch these fans like I do, you realize that they don't do a lot of reporting. They just show what the, what they're doing, and that's just about it. Um, but I wanted to ask you guys, because you guys do a lot of reporting on fisheries, and you guys have shows and articles on fisheries, but I can guarantee you that no one my age is listening to the radio. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was wondering, um, as journalists who know what you're actually supposed to be doing as journalists, which is not showing a bunch of bias and reporting straight facts, how you're gonna get this side of the story to people like me, because the only reason why I know about it is because I attend council meetings and my parents talk about it all day, every day. So, um, do you have any like pointers for what the council can do to do better, or do you have anything that you're right now considering running through your mind that you're gonna do to try to get to young people? Because he has YouTube videos and I watch YouTube all the time, so I guess you're doing things right. <laughs> I think we need to ask you where you get your okay YouTube. If you're not listening to the radio or watching TV, why? Oh, I don't what watch. would make you? I mean, what would make you watch or listen to me? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I read a lot of news articles because that's what I'm interested in. But I know that a lot of my friends don't read articles at all because they don't like to read, so. <laughs> I, know, I know my kids uh, are into podcasts, and they're the ones that get a lot of to go to radio and you know, start to learn about doing podcasts because that's where then they get their information. If you could partner with like a super interesting, charismatic person to do a podcast that doesn't say fisheries in the title. <laughs> we actually have a producer at our station, Betsy. I think it's called Wave or something. Right. Yeah, she just started. She just started a podcast on on, on, on oh, everything, oh, everything oh, ocean. Do um, kids do kids do Facebook now, or is that old old stuff? How do we gotta ask them? 
Is Facebook, is, is, he's asking, is Facebook something that you younger folks do? What I'm, what I'm getting at is photographs. If you put one, reach out there and grab you by the throat and demand you look at me picture, and then you put a little who, what, when, where, why, and how on it. I think short little Facebook documentaries would be better. Because I watch Facebook documentaries and some of my friends because that's what they scroll and see. And they watch a lot of Facebook videos or Twitter moments. If you guys could get enough of an audience to do a Twitter moment, then everyone around the world would see it every single day right there. What about uh, midweek? Doesn't every home on Oahu get midweek? <laughs> That's what, what, that was one of the things, you know, a, a guy, a kid makes Eagle Scout. You put it, uh, his photograph, who, what, when, where, why, and how, send it to midweek on a silver platter, they'll print it. Why not do that with your little fish story? But a photograph reaches out there and grabs you. And keep it simple, keep it fun, keep it short and sweet. Thank you, though, because, right, that's the next generation. They're our leaders, and they're the people that we want to get these stories across to and to find out, <laughs> find out what they think about what's going on. So thank you for, for asking those questions. I want to thank you all for being here. This has been wonderful, interesting. If you have neat stories, neat pictures, something awesome you've got, Mr. Barnacle, I'm looking at you too. Send it to us, send it to all of us, because we'd love to use it in some way. And, and if you have an expertise in some area, let us know as well. But right now, I'm going to hand it back over to Mike here. To say one more thing. Also, if you have something you would like to teach other Christian people, we definitely would like to get stories from you about that shares the knowledge that you've gained uh, about fishing, how to fish well, or the culture, or your family values about fishing and why it's important to you. Those are just as important to us as much as the fishing you catch every day. Okay, let's say a big mahalo to Nathan Eagle, Dean Santuri, Pam Wright, Captain Curry, Carol Johnson, and you know, I know Paul and I have done a lot of stuff together. But especially we can't her because she stood up the whole time. This is good. If you like this format, we'll do it again. I think it's a good idea. There's other people in the media that wanted to join us and couldn't. And I think this is a great core group to start off with. So thank you for your participation. And, and by the way, to the little girl that doesn't listen to the radio. <laughs> You need more than sound bites and a, and, a, and a Facebook Twitter. You need to pick up something and read it every now and again, and you need to go through a lot of stuff. Because I don't know how many of us have been in the shopping center, and like Kyle Ball yesterday, four kids sitting at a table by Starbucks, and they're all texting each other. I read some kids. They are your future we have a few giveaway, so don't anybody leave. But um, as a matter of fact, let's do this while the panel is still here, because we have four of them. Uh, this is a $85 package uh, from uh, Ricky Tong and Nico's at Pier 38. It's another beautiful Bullcraft lure, rigged with a stainless steel hook. Two $25 gift certificates for Nico's and an Onaga Ahi Enamel pin from PIFG. You must be here to win. You snooze, you lose. And this package goes to. Some of these people won't be here. 715122. 122. Okay. okay, this next one, um, valued 110 bucks, Hawaii Skin Diver Magazine, Sterling Kaya's Magazine, a $100 gift card to Hanapawa Fishing and Diving, and, and Onaga Ahi Enamel Pin. And this is not her mother or her sister, do we move? 715091. 091. This next one is $110 from POP Fishing and Marine. It's a $100 gift certificate and an Onaga Ahi Enamel pin from PIFT. And this $100 can be spent at Pier 38. 